Oh, yes. Welcome. You are in the club, powered by Club Colors. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We've got an extra fantastic human being on the panel today. We've got Melissa. We call her Millie Money, along with G. And our special guest, David Atkins, Executive Director of Business Strategy and Licensing at George Mason University. You're getting out of this music. I like it. It's pretty good, right? It's pretty good, right? <laughs> Well, we are absolutely honored that you made it out. Uh, flew in all the way from Virginia to join us. Had a tour. We had a great lunch together. Thank you so much for coming out and for the partnership over the years. Thank you for having me. We appreciate it greatly. My my first question is, you know, folks jump around now uh, from career to career and school to school. You've been with George Mason University for 30 plus years. You continue to innovate. You continue to come up with new ideas, new methodologies to push the brand, support the brand and stay cutting edge. How have you kept that pace over that extended period of time and stayed so loyal? I'm a true patriot. There you There's go. There's the answer. Mic There's drop. There's the answer. I'm a true patriot. No, I am an alum of the university. I graduated in 1990. Um, and my experience uh, as a student there has allowed me to translate that to my commitment uh, okay. to the university uh, and what it stands for. Um, I have been in the field close to 30 years uh, with the first part of my career being in student center management. Okay. Uh, since 2010, I've been working in the area of um, contract management, business partnerships, uh, and trademark licensing. Um, the funny thing is that when I was giving uh, the task of taking on trademark licensing, it was under the understanding that it was simply managing a contract, which our contract is with a uh, collegiate licensing okay. company. Uh, I quickly learned that that is not what it was. Okay. Uh, and learned that you, it is an actual program uh, that you have to nurture uh, in order for it to be successful for the university. Uh, and so I took on that task, and I believe it was within... Two and a half years, we doubled our royalties for the university That's because of our approach uh, to um, managing our marks through licensing. So what did you change? What did you modify? What did you enhance? How did you, how did you bring that community together to support the brand the way that you have? Well, outside of the uh, education uh, that we did uh, throughout the university, uh, helping departments and student organizations, um, to understand how to use the mark and how to use our licensed vendors, uh, we implemented a program called Spirit Fridays. Okay. And it was a way to instill campus spirit mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time not focus so much on the royalty aspect of it. Uh, and so we got the student groups, uh, the students in general, uh, the faculty and staff, uh, the departments, all rallied around encouraging everybody to wear uh, green and gold. So much that our president then uh, started implementing it uh, into the convocation for new students. It. it was pretty amazing. Um, I believe that the other uh, advisory committee that we developed, which was a partnership with uh, athletics, alumni relations, um, communications and marketing, uh, student government, our legal office, all the different offices that play some sort of a role sure. uh, in managing our trademarks at the university. So we got a lot of buy-in, and so they became ambassadors for us as well throughout the university, uh, ensuring that the marks were being used appropriately and that the guidelines were being followed in, t in terms of uh, using our licensees to uh, produce um, uh, branded apparel. For and the stay consistent with that. Obviously, you know, um, I want to touch a little bit on the importance of branding uh, in the collegiate market space. It is a huge thing. I mean, it is absolutely a community. You're literally running a city, for gosh sakes. I mean, it is a community, and you've got all these subsidiary departments, and you've got different trademarks. You've got a logo within a logo within a logo. Many um, logos. How do you get that <laughs> messaging out? maintain the consistency, police the brand, 
Can I keep going? I'll keep going. I'll, it's a task. It, 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 you heard of the phrase, it takes a village? Yeah. <laughs> yes. It takes a village at Mason to do that. Sure. It is nothing that I do alone. Uh, it is with a number of people, many that represent themselves on the licensing advisory uh, committee. Um, there is a commitment uh, to ensure the proper use okay. uh, of the brand of George Mason University. And we take that seriously. We understand that we are the ones responsible for the protection of that brand. And if we, if we don't, uh, someone else can slip in uh, and then start doing whatever yes. they want with the brand and potentially uh, Mason losing its protection authority to that particular brand. Yeah, and that, that is very difficult. You know, you've got folks that go rogue. Maybe, maybe uh, they want apparel and they've got a cousin who can put that together but doesn't necessarily have the licensing. We've seen these things not at George Mason but at in other uh at other universities uh that these types of things can go on. Folks go rogue, they may not use the folks that they're supposed to that are on a preferred list of the vendor list. Um it's a big challenge. How do you get all that messaging out and get everyone to buy in not only to the messaging but also to keep it consistent and to make it not be uh, a compliancy but an adoption. We do it a number of different ways. Outside of the education piece throughout the university, uh, there is communication that we send out through, what do you call it, our social media. Okay. Uh, even for our alumni to see, our students to see. Um, we also send messaging out through our campus uh, newsletters. Uh, we also send messaging out through our departmental mu newsletter that goes out to about 15,000 people. Um, we try to, I guess, in, instill, uh, to instill in the community of Mason uh, that it is our responsibility, that the brand is all of it's ours. The people. Right. It's not just the university, because yeah. the university is yeah. the people. Yeah. Uh, and so it is all of us protecting what is ours. So if you could sum it up, if you were going to, if, if somebody was going to say, okay, give me the three words or three phrases that describe the mission of George Mason right now, the guiding principles, uh, why would a student want to go there? You had mentioned earlier on, you said, look, my, where I am now started with the experience that you had at George Mason. So what was that experience? How would you sum that up? Let me try and define it this way. <laughs> <laughs> the um, understand when I went to Mason as a student, it was way back in 1985. Okay. 1985, 15,000 students uh, at the university. Um, we are now at about 38,000 okay. students. Okay, there's some growth. Um, it, Congratulations, admissions. There's a lot of growth <laughs> there. Um, one of the things that attracted me as a student, um, I came from a rural area. Okay. And so Mason has a lot of green space. And so I remember walking across the quad, and this is the funniest thing, but it's one of the things that actually sold me on going to Mason. And I saw students laying in the grass on the quad, reading and studying yes and i was like is not this throwing a frisbee not throwing a frisbee i mean it's like is this what education yeah. is about so that w that was pretty powerful for me um mason values access mm -hmm. to education for all one of the things that i find to be uniquely different uh maybe to some of our other partner un uh, universities is that some universities pride themselves on how many students they don't admit Got to it. the institution. That is very interesting. Mason prides itself on how many students they do admit to the university. So becoming a steward to those futures instead exactly. of a deterrent exactly. <laughs> to those, those exactly. futures. Exactly. Um, Mason has a huge commitment to uh, diversity and inclusion a huge commitment to well-being. Um, I would also say 
that one of the things that they pride themselves on would be what would be the, the correct word or terminology. Um, I, the student experience, mm-hmm. ins- ensuring that our student, when they come in as a freshman, and I, I always use the term that when they come in as a freshman, we see them as an alum. Got it. Because if you treat them as an alum when they come in as that freshman, then when they graduate, they will know how to return to the university Mm -hmm. as an alum. Um, Sometimes universities, I believe, uh, don't interact or, 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 or respond to students as an alum until they reach that particular yeah. status uh, in their in their experience at the university, and unfortunately, sometimes it's too late, uh, and so you lose out on that um, donor opportunity, uh, that involvement back to the university, that giving back to the university. Uh, but Mason, um, how would I put it, engages the student from their freshman year yeah. throughout their student career I to can, make that transition a lot easier. It's interesting you say that because even in my experience, right, um, the phone calls, the letters in regards to alumni, it feels transactional. And part of that has to do with some of what you just said. Mm-hmm. Partnerships start right. at the beginning, and if it gets to a point where it feels transactional, that means that the partnership was really never developed right. and somebody's just existing there. So you're making a conscious effort. What are some of the things that you've done um, with those new folks arriving in their freshman year to really engage them and get them into that field? Not just, you know, to kind of get them through the orientation, right? Mm -hmm. But to keep them committed and engaged on campus, in the community, and uh, participating. I think that is done through a number of different areas at the university. So one of the things that I think of and I think of it from, from a marketing perspective. How do you tell the story differently, but tell the same story? I love it. How do you tell the story differently, but tell the same story? It's a disruption. We have people who represent different genders, different cultures, different abilities, which, and, and different other things as well, sure. which require us to be a little more in tune to marketing to them versus just this mass marketing. Mm-hmm. Mass marketing is good. It will never go away. No. But somehow we need to narrow that message Speak down to each. to each community of people. Okay, You're telling... a telling the story differently, but it is the same story. Who are you telling the story to? You create the message in a way that they can hear yes. the story. So the outcome is the same, which is engagement, mm-hmm. commitment, uh, buy-in, and brand pride. Right. But the way that you get each one of those demographics, right. whether it be their degree, choice, their culture, their economic situation, how do you get them right. to hear it right. so they all move towards exactly. the same thing? Exactly. And you can't speak to everybody the same exact way. No, you absolutely cannot. So that absolutely. takes a lot more time than mass marketing. That does. That does. One of the things that we are looking at doing, and um, through because you know that I'm very involved with the Alumni Association yes. at the university. Uh, I've been the um, uh, president of the Black Alumni ch- Chapter for several years. I'm now the immediate past president. But one of the things that we are looking to do next, this uh, actually this um, um, fall, is when African-American students are admitted to the university, that the Black Alumni Chapter has plans to send communication directly to those students, welcoming them to the university. Understand, they will be at the stage where they still will be able to make a decision whether to come to Mason or some other university. If we're a part of that decision, I would think that 
they will be more inclined to decide to come to George Mason if they have received a personal reach out. And stay. And and stay. And then once we bring them to the university, we will do programs such as receptions and uh, uh, engagement activities with faculty, staff, and student leaders Mm -hmm. to make sure that they have that, what do you call it, um, um, foundation, uh, that support system uh, once they hit the ground. And third-party influence. And third-party influence. Yes. So... I and always understanding the importance of wearing green and gold at Mason. Always green and gold, green and gold. That's the way it goes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first time that we met, I was a little bit scared though because we are outside of Chicago, and I am a Bears fan. And if you guys could just kind of change, like, ah, that's fine. How about the Packers change their colors? No, okay, that's fine. You guys got there first. How about that? We did. Yeah, yours looks way better. We'll do it that way. So let's talk about decision-making because you have a degree in the science of decision-making, which is by far the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life, Melly Money. I know you like that, too. We were giggling, like, what in the world is a degree in decision-making? And I don't know if you did that great because you decided to come on our podcast today, so I'm a little worried for you. Uh, But decision-making, the the science of decision-making, what does that entail? It is a degree in decision science out of the School of Business. That degree does not exist. (laughs) (laughs) David made all the decisions. They're done. Once I received the the degree, they shut the program down. (laughs) Enough (laughs) said. (laughs) Yeah, enough said. There's no decisions left to be made. All decisions are made. Um, But essentially, um, I think Mason was very uh, innovative and uh, cutting edge at that particular time um, in the school's history uh, with that program. Because uh, I can remember going out on interviews um, after, after graduating from Mason, and that would be like the top of the conversation. What is that degree? Yeah. What is it? So I started to believe that because I wasn't always getting the job. So people were <laughs> asking me to come in just to learn about what yeah, this wait, degree yeah. is. <laughs> so, I'm um, not telling unless I get the job. Exactly. <laughs> but um, essentially that program now is um, – named under the term of information systems and operations management. So it's, it's pretty generic across other universities. Um, and it is it is a degree that I earned, but um, at that particular time, I realized, even though I am an introverted inter- individual, I realized that I did not uh, want to sit at a computer yeah. um, doing a lot of data analyzing. Um, so I tried to figure out how I could uh, translate that to something where I was able to work more with uh, people. Okay. Um, and so I really focused in or made the decision to major in decision science after decided not to be an accountant, not to get a, de- a degree in marketing, not to get a degree in management, and decided on decision science because I uh, took a class under Dr. Dodds who was teaching um, um, production production management, operations production management. And I was like, this is pretty cool. And so when I graduated, uh, I immediately uh, was hired for a job as the assistant operations uh, director for uh, our student centers. And so I tried to figure out how I could use the things that I learned in that program to kind of serve a community of people. Yeah. Uh, and so I've kind of found some success in that regard. I'm a very analytical, uh, very analytical. You're individual. also a very social I, I, introvert. I am a social in- introvert. Um, but when this pa- podcast is over, I am going to my room. <laughs> 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 You're putting on your Snuggie and, and turn out the lights and it's over. No, I'm not talking to anybody. There you go. I understand there that. You go. Everybody's got to find their, their kind of their space, their quiet time. What will we find you doing in your, uh, your personal time, your quiet yeah, time? You're a little too personal here, aren't you? I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, there's the introvert. The introvert came out. No, I, you will find me, well, in my home. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what I like to do. Please. Let's start there. I like traveling. Okay, I have a passion for traveling, um, internationally and and domestically. Um, at home and in the states, you will probably find me doing very very simple things. In my yard, mm-hmm. doing yard work, uh, you will find me uh, in the house watching Netflix. <laughs> you will find me um, at a movie theater. 
alone enjoying yes. a movie. Yes, because it nobody's the, tapping on it you. It is the best thing. Mm-hmm. That, my friends do not understand. Debbie, you go to the movies alone? Yeah. Like, how else do you go? <laughs> yeah. it, it is It is the best thing for me. I, I love my downtime. I love being with my friends uh, and sure. family, uh, but I value, I, I absolutely value my downtime. Well, we talked about that you're a, uh, a friend sprinter. You're not you're not a marathon uh, un, a marathon time person with friendships yeah. like you short, you want short times sh- impactful. Mm-hmm. Let's go let's go see Egypt. You went yes. to uh-huh. Ghana. Uh-huh. I mean, come on, Panama Canal. Uh-huh. So, are you traveling because you have this craving to educate yourself and to become more knowledgeable? Is it the is it to step outside and see what the world is? What's really driving that? It, what what are you feeding? It is a desire to see how others live Ah. in different places of the world. Um, And one of the things that I valued about our trip to uh, Egypt is that we were able, because tourism is a real big thing uh, for them there, and uh, and apparently they have families and homes that open them up for tourists to come in to see how they live. And so, and you, you know, you, you, they might do the hand or tattoos for you. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, you give them tips or whatever. It was the best experience for me. Um, I like, whether this is in state or out of state, I may be telling people too much information here, but anyway, <laughs> um, I'm a big people watcher. I love watching people. I, I will enjoy sitting here and watching you interact with someone yeah, over absolutely. there. Versus me being a part of that interaction with you. Yeah. So yeah, that's just. I noticed too at lunch that you are a very, um, you're a very engaging listener. Oh, I am. You, I mean, you, you kind of like get, you kind of like get yourself into like a position where you're like, and you get a facial expression. And you're like, okay, let's see. And you're really taking it in, but you're not just hearing the words. You're getting the body language. It, it is more important for me to hear what a person is saying to me versus what I feel I want to say to the person. So you're actively listening. Yes, I am actively listening. Um, Some of that may come from my um, vocational experience. Um, You know that I have a decision science degree from George Mason. I also have a master's degree in theology from Howard University. Um, I am also a licensed minister, which a lot of people don't know that. And so that experience, that vocational experience, has placed me in a, in a position where I listen to people a lot. Um, and, w- and, and a lot of times without having a response. I remember one of my students, um, when I was the as- assistant director of operations uh, for the student centers, I remember him coming into me and sharing heavily uh, things that were going on with him. And as soon as I, he saw my body language, Mm -hmm. I was getting ready to offer some advice or or sentiments. And and he said, David, you can't solve this. Yes. I just want you to listen. And it, it, it opened my, oh, my God, it opened my eyes so widely. And so I have, from that one experience, I have just learned to listen. And I have also, and when I, and when I think I really need to say something, I ask for permission. I don't assume That's the great. person wants, wants me to Sometimes actually Sometimes they just want to hear them. Right, right, right. You know what's amazing? Mental health is, um, is a passion of mine, and I think it's becoming more and more Mm -hmm. spoken about accepted and it's so interesting you say that because listening is such a tremendous quality for somebody to have on the other side of that far too often people want to try and fix somebody or give them the wing dinger piece of advice that's going to like the wiring is not the same as the person giving that answer so I could really thoroughly appreciate how that would make you uh, very endearing Mm -hmm. uh, to folks but also it's a great leadership quality um, it's, you know, they say leaders speak last, right. right? Right. And that's because they're listening and they're taking up in all the information. But also listening has helped me decide how to present 
branding opportunity mm-hmm. to uh, Mason because um, we listen to this. I personally, I listen to the students. I intentionally teach a University 100 class. Uh, is a class to stay of engaged. The students, the, the freshman class, every year, so I can hear what it is that they they're wanting or thinking, because that helps me decide how to market to them on social media and, and through newsletters. Uh, yeah, there's uh, such a great advantage there from a branding standpoint because you have your own uh, kind of market research every year. Yes, you have a new group <laughs> every year. of of uh, innovators and dreamers mm-hmm. and hope hopeful people that want to have a voice. And to lend them that uh, that opportunity is beneficial to them, but it also is yes. a benefit to the university. To what's the next greatest thing? Exactly. So, what's the next greatest thing? What is the next? What greatest is the next thing? greatest thing? Hmm. Well, I really don't know the answer to that. All right. <laughs> but but what I have seen come across my desk is this thought of uh, licensing digital products. Okay, let's go, David. What is what? Are, where are we going here? <laughs> this is licensing, it's about to get real. Where yeah, are we going, David? Licensing digital products. There's this thing that's out there where you uh, license uh, uh, things such as audio or photos or 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 or, or um, NFTs. Uh, it's non-fungible it's token. Non-fungible token. Got exactly. it. Nice. So it could be something as much, something as simple as uh, a former college athlete in their uniform. It could be, um, it could be the mascot. Uh, it could be a number of different things that a buyer finds valuable to them, and where they would like pay for the yeah, license. And absolutely. so there will be royalties associated with it. So that is conversation that is happening uh, with our um, uh, collegiate licensing partner right now. I love it. What are the joys of licensing for you now? Like the the ability to kind of think outside the box. But it's amazing you think so far outside the box, but you're doing it within a structure of legalities and policy. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a lot of structure. How do you stay creative and outside the box within the structure? I don't believe that the structure is that restrictive. Okay. Um, anytime you want to be creative uh, and you feel that you're being restricted, you feel that you're being restricted by some policy, I am a true believer that if you read the policy close enough, there is probably some wiggle room mm-hmm. for you to accomplish whatever it is that you want to accomplish. Was that in the decision science? Was that was that part of it? So I I need to touch on this, David. I'm gonna I'm gonna. <laughs> you're a licensing guy. Uh, those of you that haven't looked up David, he's got a TM next to his name. I mean, come on, how cool is that? Oh, wow. Come on. You saw that? I saw that. Well, let me tell you that TM that TM existed well before I started uh, in the trademark licensing profession. Okay. So here. So you trademarked your name before you were in license. So what is this like? You were manifest well, destiny. You were kind of like getting your. <laughs> you saw it and then became it. Well, <coughs> how would I put this? Trade trademark. How we look. How I look at uh, what a trademark is. It is a way of uh, identifying some level of protection. Okay. It it communicates some form of ownership or belonging to someone or something, right? Uh-huh. And so going to my spiritual side, Here we go. that's why I said it existed well before my trademark licensing professional career. Um, when I became a licensed minister and, and, and my faith developed, I associated the TM with my name to communicate me belonging to and being protected Uh by a greater being that I refer to as God. I love this. This is fantastic. A hit. Very good. What do you want to say? Uh, Well, I just wanted to uh, um, go back a little bit because I I am a little overwhelmed um, with awesomeness. Don't get me wrong. (laughs) Uh, You just got the overwhelm awesomeness uh, compliment. um, when you started, when you were describing, um, you know, all of all of the things that kind of involve your role at George Mason, um, 
what really stood out to me the most was that your focus, your mission is really bringing a sense of community to everybody there on that campus. It's that belonging. It's that um, being able to identify with the campus. You are creating a true space for all of these students, all of the faculty, anyone who interacts with the campus. That seems to be your focus and your mission. And honestly, who better to do that than someone who attended the campus themselves? And you're obviously very, very passionate about it. So the thing that I would really want to ask is, when you think about the community at George Mason, apart from being all-inclusive and um, a, you know, pushing education accessi accessibility to all, mm -hmm. How would you describe that community on campus? Hmm, good question. Um, the first term that comes to mind would be connectedness. Um, it would be nurturing. Uh, it would be caring. It would be respectful. Um, it would be achieving. It would be goal-oriented. Um, it would be thriving together. I mean, those are the words that come to mind when, when I'm thinking about your question, prom your, your prompted question there. Yeah. It just reminded me, um, you, it was an absolute pleasure to take you on a tour of our facilities here and interact with our team. And you know how seriously we take teamwork, mm -hmm. and it really takes everybody and you started right off, this is not a one-man show. I need everybody. I need the help. You know, I get everyone involved. You're going to freshman 101 students to keep everything fresh and on point and relevant to every class that comes in. Um, I'm just, I'm very impressed, and I think uh, what you're creating there on campus is, is fantastic. Thank you. Thank How about you. a round of applause for David? <laughs> <laughs> so, David, when you speak to your peers, yes. um, I would imagine that you have to have some interaction with folks to see what other universities yes. are doing. Uh, we never want to compare ourselves to other people, but it's good to kind of understand. I never compare myself to right? anybody else. I'm my greatest competitor. Yes. yes. And guess what? There should be no other way of thinking for anyone out there listening. You only got to be better than you were yesterday, not anybody else. But with that being said, you still want to see what's out there, what's going on, what's innovating. Uh, when, you, when you have a chance to speak to some of your peers at different universities, um, where do you see that George Mason is kind of innovating and out in the forefront and kind of pioneers, if you will, for some of the branding and licensing mission? Oh, branding. Uh, and there may be other areas, but the one that first come to mind would be around um, our consumables. Okay. Um, as you know, we licensed uh, a wine, uh, a few. <coughs> oh, you don't say. Well, well, <laughs> well, where did that come from? We licensed a wine a few years ago called the Geo Mason wine. Uh, it was uh, a project that uh, started with our board of trustees, actually. Uh, and then it, it elevated up to becoming a licensed uh, product. Uh, and Siema Wines uh, is the... Um, oh wine distribution company that we work with to distribute the wine throughout. Uh, and somehow you have found how to get it delivered all the way here to Chicago. <laughs> David, <laughs> we can source anything. We can find <laughs> anything. Literally. We were able to track this down. Lindsay, Miss Lindsay Purcell, one of our fabulous brand advisors here, who actually is partners with you on uh, the George Mason partnership, was able to track this down and get it shipped within days and it's actually nice and cool and refreshing perhaps we'll open this one up that would be nice and uh, we, will, we will share in some spirits because we are all, bo all both very spirited <laughs> let me tell you my passion behind that Please. project is that the proceeds the proceeds that come from the wine uh which is pretty significant uh, goes to support student scholarships at the university. That's beautiful. Everybody and get on some Geo Mason. There you go, <laughs> Geo Mason. And I, to date, I believe we have generated over $30,000 of student scholarship support from the seller. That's outstanding. Well, which is awesome. That's awesome. Um, the other project is um, um, 
beer. We licensed a beer for the first time ever um, called the Patriots 57. Uh, and Beltway Brewing Company out in Sterling, they were our partner uh, with that. And it is what is so exciting to me about that. It's two things, actually. Well, more, more is one. Um, is that it? the beer is made with honey from our honeybee initiative at the university. So we have beehives at the university. Okay. So the honey from those bees are used to make the beer. Uh, called Patriots 57. So it's pretty amazing. So all the money from that actually goes to education and research to further that particular initiative. That's called utilizing your resources to continue to push your brand. I mean, exactly. utilizing exactly. everything that you have at, at, at your fingertips. I'm curious what you think is going to happen over the next two to five years mm -hmm. as technology continues to improve and licensing is seemingly not slowing down, especially in the collegiate market. It's becoming so um, uh, technology-focused, however. So how do you see that innovation changing over the next two to five years, and what's in store? Your NFT. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the, we got to go back. The, the thing I wanted to add to that as well, David, is um, you, you mentioned it, it could be an athlete, a photo mm -hmm. of an athlete in their uniform, right? How about a replay of a special moment in uh, whether yes. a championship, a Ab big game, um, a moment where a, a coach got very emotional and talked about a specific player or uh, maybe locker they, room they, speech, all, locker all, room speech, all of that, all of that, okay. all of that. Yes, all of it. Absolutely. If absolutely. You can record it. It can be like, exactly. so there's a big push then for yeah. media um, as it relates to marketing collateral yes. um, and trademarking, mm -hmm. right? Take making clips. Yes. Gee, we got to get on it. We need more, right. We're going to need more cameras. Out some sidelines. We're going to need more cameras, G. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know, because you can only, I, I believe it will be operated at a level where you will only be able to generate royalties on it once. Um, but, you know, the story, there is a the, the other side of me that says, <laughs> that says, it's an audio, so why would someone purchase that that might end up on social media. Why would somebody buy a baseball card for ten grand? Why? Why? We're just consuming I different. I mean, it is. It is. By the way, it if is. you want to buy my Eddie Murray it's rookie right. card, it's the whole thing that that I have it. I I have it. I I have it. So yeah, that there, there is a consumer market out there that will actually pay for that. I have it. Yeah. I mean, if people want to buy something, you you certainly you have a responsibility to, to find a way to get it to them. Yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you go where the money is, right? Yes. But if you could do it at the same time while serving a purpose and driving your, your brand mission, while um, highlighting that moment for your university, which, again, is a brand push, and somebody is willing to, to uh, provide the capital for that and capitalize off of it, mm -hmm. go for it. Absolutely. So for Club Colors and so many other corporations, I would imagine the collegiate market as well, the pandemic exposed weaknesses to our operation. It exposed weaknesses to our personnel. It certainly exposed weaknesses to the man looking in the mirror back at me. Um, and those weaknesses being exposed allowed us to work on them because we had the time to do that, to kind of drive to the next level. Is that what you're seeing happening? Is that what you mean? Where you kind of... You kind of had a chance to maybe analyze some of where you're at, and it's you're going to take where you were and kind of just modify and tweak off of those weaknesses that were um, exposed and then regalvanize to come back stronger before you start to innovate. Yes, but I would also say that the pandemic exposed some opportunity. Yes. Uh, some real, real true opportunities in terms of technology. Um and how we can do business differently versus honestly being in the same room with one another, mm -hmm. uh, how we can uh, save on operational costs and still be as effective, if not more yes. effective. Um, we have, uh, I would have never imagined um, having meetings <laughs> <laughs> and productive meetings on zoom absolutely not um that was like that was never never done i've never had a meeting on zoom prior to being in COVID. 
And now I can't even imagine what it would be like without it. Yes. Yeah. And so whether whenever we go back to to the offices and, um, you know, have face to face meeting meetings, we will still have two or three people. Yeah, we will Somebody still have Zoom state. meetings. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I have found great benefit from having Zoom meetings. And a lot of times I don't use um, phone calls anymore. I do Zoom meetings. You know, we, it was interesting as we were talking, and I'm, I want to ask you what a brilliant, great partner looks like to you prior to doing that. I just want to touch on this to your point. Zoom meetings kind of changed the way that that our business model worked because we were a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, and we weren't necessarily traveling out to clients as often. I mean, we have a huge client base. It's tough to get out there. People don't have the time for it. So a lot of quick type process, um, you know, logoed items that we're getting out. So that you're not going to fly out to Virginia f- to do a thousand piece sweatshirt order, right? right? <laughs> so, but the transfer of energy through a Zoom call to be able to see the facial expressions like for instance to see how you listen i couldn't see how you listen through the phone but to see how you listen changes my thought process of you which strengthens partnerships so i'm curious what does an amazing partnership look like to you Hmm. other than body language and facial expressions other than body language (laughs) and facial expressions um i think the first thing that comes to mind is a partner who understands the mission and values of George Mason. Yes. Uh, and then someone who is committed enough to invest uh, in those values. Um, transactions will happen. Transactions can happen with anybody. Mm -hmm. True partnerships really only happen. Give and take. Yes, right. And where there is a benefit Mm -hmm. to both involved. Um, So that's, yeah, that's what a true partnership is. You know what I love about a a true partnership, too, is the ability to say no to each other. Oh, absolutely. Or to disagree. Yes. Um, Transactional tends to be yes. Yes, no problem. Right. Order take. Partnerships means, David, I know you, I know you really like that, but can I make a recommendation? Right. Here's a better way. Right. And you still could say, no, no, you can't. Right. Or um, if there's enough street credit and there's enough uh, previous work experience and, and outcomes that were attained, then you say, hey, look, all right, let's bring on the advice. That's where true partnerships really start to mature right. and go to the next level. Right. So um, I'm curious if you were going to uh, say uh, what the most important part of your brand mission is right now, how would you define going in, going into the tail end of 2021 into 2022? You talked about a partner understanding your brand mission, understanding the culture. What's number one for you right now in George Mason University? A, a brand review, a brand refresh. A brand refresh. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who listens. We love brand refresh. It is. Yeah. Um, we are entering into a brand refresh uh, as I am speaking to you live right now. All right. Uh, that is led by our... Um, Vice President for Communications and and Marketing. Um, There are a number of people, probably about 100 different voices um, that will be heard throughout the process, if not more, uh, to determine what that looks like, what our future messaging is, uh, all to culminate around the 50th uh, anniversary that the university will celebrate in April of 2022. Okay. Uh, so this is exciting. There are exciting times. I mean, times. that's exciting. It is exciting times. And we ha- as we have new leadership at the university, um, our new president came uh, in a l- maybe a little over a year ago, ago now, uh, Dr. Uh, Gregory Washington. Um, he is awesome. I've been a part of several different uh, meetings with him. I listened um, to his podcast, by oh, the way. Ha- is he, he's awesome. It's he, pretty tight. I, absolutely. Um so we're excited about where we're going under our new leadership at the university. So 
a new leadership comes in, new regime, right? New president. Mm-hmm. Um, and the messaging starts to come down. What got you most excited? Uh, the messaging of what? Well, typically when a new president comes in, right? New president of a university, there's some changes. There's some modifications. There might be some cultural changes. There might be some policy procedure changes. So what got you going? Yes! Here we go! I'm going to... Uh, answer that but first i'm going to say this <laughs> uh oh <laughs> uh remember our president came in in june in june of 2020 june of 20 perfect time to perfect time to start a new <laughs> a new career in the cusp of i mean in it cusp yeah of COVID. And the and point so where nobody knew and anything about anything, right? Exactly. Just fear. We were all um, just home. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, so his primary focus has been leading us through that. And great kudos to him uh, and his leadership team in doing he's that. He's got a calm about him. He's yes, got he like does. a powerful, he he's very powerful in his, he's, he's got a baritone kind of voice, right? Uh, but there is a calm communication style it's confidence mm-hmm. um so i'm curious comes in and starts uh kind of going through i would imagine he analyzed for a month or two and then starts saying okay here's how we're going to handle this or what were some of those things that got you excited one of his biggest i'm gonna say it's one of his biggest initiatives, or i would just say one of his initiatives it has been around the formation of the, um, it's called ARI, and I'm not going to get the whole acronym correct, but it's basically around anti-racism at our university. Uh, And there are, there's well over 100 people involved and voices through that process. Um, It is looking at eliminating um, negative experiences that people might have, whether they are student or uh, faculty staff at the university, and there's a lot. Now, I said that in a few a few words, yeah. and say, but there's a lot uh, to unpack around oh my Lord. around that. Uh, so they that group of people are doing amazing uh, work around that particular issue at the university. Um, it will some of that work will also tie into the unveiling of our what do you call it, Um, Wilkins Plaza, uh, where it is between our main student center, the Johnson Center, and the New Horizon building uh, that uh, opened recently. And on that plaza, we have always had our, the statue of the George Mason statue there. George Mason uh, had slaves. And so what we are going to do is incorporate imageries of um, the children of the slaves okay. uh, so that when you visualize through these imageries, it leads up to the George Mason statue. So we're not ignoring, keeping silent yeah. uh, that who our founder mm-hmm. was. Uh, we're acknowledging it yes. and, and we are embracing it, uh, calling it what it is, mm-hmm. and then um, uh, allowing that history to unfold and to and to look at it as an achievement, absolutely, right, absolutely, and a growth, absolutely, and that achievement and that growth creates an energy, right, and hopefully, um, that mission has continued to create a positive experience. Boy, oh boy, if people would just be nice, right, just be nice. You know, that's the best marketing tool you could ever have. Just be, be nice. nice, be kind. Wow. <laughs> I mean, as listen simple, to each as other. As simple as that is saying. It, I wish it wasn't. <laughs> I, w- I wish it wasn't so simple to say and so hard to imagine that it's so hard for people to do. I love um, that you're highlighting that journey, and then just um, that that contrast of, you know, we have opportunity grows from the roots of adversity, and you mentioned that also works for diversity. And I opportunity love that grows from the roots of diversity. Right. That you just told. That's right. right. That's right. Being inclusive. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, David, I have to ask. 
and I'm surprised no one has asked it yet. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> just from the past couple hours that we've spent with you. Um, where does the confidence come from? I mean, it oozes in the way that you speak, in the way that you listen, like John said earlier, in the way that you see the world, in the way that you see yourself. Was it um, a, a certain way that your parents spoke to you growing up? Was it a certain conversation that you're having with yourself on a regular basis? Is there a practice that um, you can lend to listeners right now to say, hey, do this for yourself. This works for me. Um, is it a combination of those things? What are what are a few of those things that have um, done that for you? I'm going to mention two. Uh, so one is um, directly related to my mother. Um, she instilled in me, I guess the way I would describe it, um, fearlessness. Fearlessness. Fearless, is that again? Yeah. Fearlessness. Fearlessness. She instilled in me fearlessness um, from a young child. Um, and it has been through that that I have been able to, uh, I guess, stand stand strong and, and stand supported. Uh, even, even from her grave. My mom died in 2000, um, 2006. Uh, and even from her grave, I still feel her presence. Um, and the strangest thing, and I've, I've never shared this with anybody live, so here we go on live. So <laughs> <laughs> I've never shared this. When my, when my mom died, there was a complete hole that I felt. Really? In my body, a hole. And yeah. I, I have never felt anything like it. It's like <laughs> there is something, not just something missing. I felt a, a real actual, hole yeah. in my body. Um but over time, and, and a, a one of my other relatives shared with me that it, it will never go away. It will just get better. Mm-hmm. And so over the years, it has gotten better. And so I feel that, that hole being filled more with her, with her presence of her spirit, if that, yeah. if that means anything. It makes anything. total sense to me. Right. Um, so that is one thing. And I, I always feel that I need, to, even more now that she's not here, that I need to represent her life, her um, brand, her brand. Amen. <laughs> yes, her brand. Um, even more presently. The other thing is, is that um, when I was in college, I actually joined a fraternity, and I was probably more of an introvert um, <laughs> than I am now. Um, but that fraternity was Alpha Phi Alpha, and it was a fraternity of, of brothers. And I had never experienced that type of brotherhood and support uh, and encouragement. Camaraderie. Camaraderie. And, and like, you, you succeed. You and do not empathy. take empathy. You do not take steps backwards. Everything mm-hmm. is forward. Yeah. It, it, and if you take a step, it is so Somebody's good. pushing you if back you, up. Exactly. They will not mm-hmm. let you take a step backwards. And, and, and I think because of that relationship as well, uh, it has allowed me to be more confident mm. in terms of who I am and how I present myself. Um, yeah. Amen. And, and, and you know what? Thank you. Thank you for being transparent and sharing that with us because um, I, I know that's not an easy conversation to have. Um, and, and also... Uh, Thank you to your mother um, for for putting that light in you that now you're Mm -hmm. sharing with the rest of the world. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, you know, that's such an important important point, G, that that I'm like, I got an out of my throat because I was just thinking about my father who passed. But that spirit fills you, and you are carrying out, you're carrying out that brand, that lineage. You talked about the fearlessness. Um, Do you get afraid to fail? There's so many students that are on your campus that are afraid to take a shot, afraid, and it consumes them. Talk to us and students that may hopefully listen at some point um, why they shouldn't have fear. You have to fail. You have to fail to move forward. You have to learn from something to do better at the next thing. Failure is good. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with failure at all. I've failed a plenty of times, 
But I will tell you, I have succeeded more times than I have failed. I can definitely yes. tell you that. Absolutely. You learn more from failing Absolutely. than you do from winning. Absolutely. Because the winning, you get caught up in the pride. Yes. Failing, that pride gets hurt, and it helps you to recognize. And if you're driven, then, of course, at that point, you're going you're gonna to find another way. You're going to keep pushing. Um, I want to know um, – what would be the next role if you were going to have a next role? Now we're not going to we're not going to mess with Doctor Washington and say president, okay? <laughs> you know you got to go back and everything, so we don't want to do that. But what would be the next role if you could pick your role? You ready? I'm ready. You ready? Ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Retiree. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. Yes. More travel. I, I'm telling you, I don't care what roles I have between now and then. My ultimate role in life is retiree. Okay. That is it. Um, will you be a retiree, though? What, like, will you chill? Chill in the sense of it would look like this. I travel a uh -huh. lot more. Uh, I... Um, volunteer mm -hmm. a lot more. I probably probably would become even more uh, involved with my uh, university from my alumni status. Uh, I would just have more time to do those things. Yeah, I, I will always be committed to George Mason University. I mean, your your footprint is all over it. <laughs> There's a lots of footprints. <laughs> <laughs> There's a path. I've I've been there for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have. Um, no, I, I, I really have, um, I guess, great respect for my journey um, through Mason. Um, I remember having to give a speech to faculty and staff around uh, Giving Day um, about my experience as a former student um, and having been a student who received scholarships and who received financial aid, those are the reasons, outside of just the other ex positive experiences I had as a student, that instilled in me and encouraged me um, and almost just, um, I don't know, um, made me even more committed to giving back in a financial way to the university to help other students uh, so. achieve what I was able to achieve as a student. Um, so one, and I always share people that one of my uh, greatest accomplishments as an alum was actually creating or and and uh, uh, um, drive being the driving force behind the creation of the first uh, alumni uh, chapter driven endowment uh, at the university, and we usually have five, what is it, five years to endow it, and we were able to do so in 15, 15 months. We was able How to did do you so do in that? 15 months. What was the difference? Very right creatively. Apparently. <laughs> Very creatively. And effectively. Um, and effectively. Um, we hosted a number of different events, to, um, being, you familiar with step shows? I will, I will be in a second. You will be in a second. <laughs> um, well, most universities have what they call Greeks. Okay. Uh, they could be uh, IFC uh, or, or Panhale or what I'm referring to is NPAC, the National Panhellenic Council, uh, which consists of what they refer to as the Divine Nine, uh, black Greek organization uh, at the university. And so we invited um, the um, alums representing those divine nine organizations to partner with current students at the university to create a show that would be presented during alumni weekend, and we did it two years in a row. Um, and so the sh show raised, I mean, the show raised, I believe, between the two probably over, I think, $15,000. Uh, between the two shows, but outside of just the raising the money for the scholarship, what it also did, it created 
uh, networking opportunities between sure. alumni and current students. Yes. Uh, and so it was amazing. So it became me. like a recruiting it is. method. It, it, it did. It, it did all of that. Job it did, placement. It did all of that. It did all of that. Um, and then um, between that and, you know, just general people uh, giving to the endowment, not related to any programming. And then we got one huge gift uh, from another foundation um, who recognized uh, what the chapter was doing and how it was rec recognizing its alumni. Uh, and so in 15 months, we had the endowment um, funded. And today, so that was in 2000, I think that was like 2011. And so today, uh, that endowment sits at over $170,000. So we are very That's excited sick. about that. So we were talking a little bit about um, the Fairfax area and kind of the community for the campus as well, right? We were talking about at lunch, we were talking about how you're trying to get more folks from the community to come into yes. the campus and more people from the campus to get involved in the community. Can you talk a little bit about, without giving too much away, because I know you're, it's a work in progress, work right? In so progress. I don't want to, I don't want to drop <laughs> you. I don't want to take your glory, uh, but talk a little bit about the concept of how you are creating this, um, Synergy. The synergy between and what it's going to do for economic conditions, what it's going to do for job placement, how it's going to enhance the community, how it'll push the brand. I mean, it's there's some layers here. There, there's a lot of layers there. Uh, it is about creating a stronger uh, town-gown relationship mm -hmm. between Fairfax City and George Mason University. Um and so we are working with the uh, Economic Development Authority and the um, Fairfax uh, uh, Business Association uh, to see how we can work together to accomplish that goal. And so one of the, outside of the things that you just shared in terms of uh, kind of the long-term things in terms of job placement and that type of stuff, uh, one of the immediate things that we hope to introduce uh, in the fall is our um, Patriot Perks program, which where uh, local businesses will offer discounts to faculty, staff, students, and alumni uh, to draw them down into the city. And we also hope to infuse uh, even more our Spirit Fridays program uh, so that when our alum go down and students go down and faculty and staff go down to the city, on Fridays, they will also be able to um, um, experience yes. that celebration happening in the community uh, and not just on the campus. We always tell our alumni, wherever you are on uh, Spirit Fridays, wear your green. You're still on campus. Exactly. Wherever Create your own you campus. Are, wherever you are. Show your pride. Show your pride. Show your be pride. a patriot. Once a patriot. Always a patriot. Always a patriot. There's how it is. <laughs> well, I love that too because uh, you know you work so hard to create this community on campus throughout the alumni throughout the community and and everything that you know you're you're planning on doing upcoming and just to improve all around everything between the campus and the Fairfax area. Um, <coughs> why wouldn't they want to represent? Why wouldn't they want to uh, bring a piece of that wherever they're going? Because yeah, look at my green and, and gold and, and look at what we're doing on the campus here and look at the results that we're getting from our students, from our faculty, from our staff. Um, that's that's a lot to be proud of. I totally agree. <laughs> I, He's not going to I, no. put that uh, compliment to the side. No, <laughs> I totally agree. As an alumni, I recognize the value of my degree. Uh, this many years later, I recognize the value of my degree. And when I walk in any community wearing mason gold, yeah. I know I am looked at like, where, oh, wow, okay. he went to Mason. Mm -hmm. He goes to Mason. I was just recently in June, even though it was COVID, <laughs> June, I traveled to um, – Melbourne, Florida, and I'm forgetting where we went to after there. But anyway, on our way back, we uh, stopped at a restaurant. And, of course, I'm wearing Mason, Just Mason, Mason gear. And I'm, I'm visiting with another alum who actually was my mentee uh, when he was a student at Mason. And we're eating. And at the end of the breakfast, 
this gentleman walks over, um, and his family is kind of in the background, and he was like, you went to Mesa? I was like, yeah. And so it was the opportunity for this great interaction and conversation to happen oh. and to learn that, you know, obviously he went to Mason as well and uh, he uh, got his degree in um, a computer science or engineering, whatever the case it was. But the person that I was visiting was also an alum and they were in the same program at different times. So them both living in Florida, that made for an even stronger connection for them. So it was just it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So branding creates commonality. Oh, absolutely. Commonality opens the door for friendships. Absolutely. Because most really strong friendships, there is a commonality. Absolutely. I think back to like some of the best friends that I have. It's because of something else. Went to school together, right. played baseball together, you know, same church, whatever it might be, whatever your thing is. But that commonality, right. and that's what branding is. It's to create the commonality, the feeling, the experience, right. and to get everyone to buy in. And and I'm. I love that that opens up the door not only for financial success, but friendships, purpose, right. all those things. Right. Speaking of that, uh -oh. what is the greater purpose for you? Tell me your ideal George Mason University scenario. What's your dream scenario right now? Oh, dream. For the scenario. campus. Like, oh, I, I have it. I have it. Oh, Let's go. <laughs> Lay it on. I <laughs> have it. Coach English, I hope you're listening. <laughs> coach English, call it. <laughs> Lindsay, Lindsay, get Coach English on the horn. Round of applause English. for Coach English. English. <laughs> coach English is our new uh, men's basketball coach. And okay, I, let's go. I am already excited about his presence uh, on the campus and what he is doing with the men's basketball program. But Final Four. I am hoping and praying that we are going to be in the Final Four. That's, that, that's my dream. Again, we've done it before. I was able to experience that uh, as the director of the student centers then, and I would see these long <laughs> lines strolling outside of the building trying to get into the bookstore to purchase. Uh, it was then the Sweet 16 shirt. I want to experience this. Yeah. As the university trademark licensing director, I know I would oh. be working like crazy, like crazy, but I want to experience the, that. <laughs> the opportunity for yes. creativity, the opportunity yes. for royalties, the yes. opportunity yes. for collectiveness yes. and engagement yes. and all those things is just yes. outstanding. The final four, man, I got to tell you, that is what a thing that is. We run an incentive every year with the final four. We have so much fun. So based on the amount of uh, sales within a certain territory, right? They can rack up points, and then we go, we go, we might run out like a bar that we probably had lunch at today, and they will essentially uh, have an auction. So they'll auction off which team, and then as they play, they it narrows it down so that the top four get the biggest bonus money. And, I mean, it is a thing, right? It was amazing. Great the auctions time. get yes. ugly. The auctions get <laughs> ugly. There was a lot of fight, infighting and, you know, people saying uh, $1 more. Know just to get that extra team. I think you did that a couple of times, Melly Money. Melissa was in there. Uh, it, was, it was a fight for her. So, <laughs> so <laughs> Coach English, you got to get you got to get this team going. They should be doing shuffles right now, <laughs> shuttle runs, wind sprints. They're, you know, they're doing it all. I'm sure they're working they're it right it now. And he is very social media based. So is you he? Can, you can you can, if you're following him on Instagram, you can see them what they're doing. Exactly. I love it. I love it. I love that as well. So what are you guys doing in the way of hashtags? What's the new hashtag that we should be following? New hashtag, new hashtag. What's the, what's the most powerful one on campus? I don't know if I can give you a powerful one on campus. Well, the one that has the most response. Um, oh, my God. There is. Da, da, da. Or a type of post or <laughs> I'm gonna what seems to be the thing. What, what kind of content are you guys creating? I love how, you, I love how you, write, you write everything down before you say it. <laughs> <laughs> like, am I thinking this? Hold on. If I write it, I'm thinking it. Yes, I am thinking it. Is this okay to say out loud? I love it. <laughs> can, I say, can I say this out loud? Can, exactly. I'm licensing this. So I'm going to tell, I will always tell you hashtag we are Mason. Okay. Because that is the one that is directly associated with everything that we do in terms of um, licensed product. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and promoting uh, campus spirit in that sense. But I will also say that there is a new hashtag. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> that our um, new coach has introduced, and it is called Rock With Us. Rock I liked it. With Us. 
Basketball. Basketball. Pass me the rock. Um, rock with us. Those of you. Yeah. I know, Melly, you're you're out, you know, on the courts playing, but for Gene and I, we didn't know Every what day. that meant. So had to clarify. Pass me the rock. <laughs> <laughs> Final four, George Mason. Let's get it. There you go. Oh, yeah. So you get a chance in the role that you're at um, to engage with people. And, and it seems to me that you've got this mission in life to be a steward to men and women. Um, and it, you've made a lot of choices in that regard to be a steward to. So tell me how how that that love of people, that faith, um, and that willingness to really engage and listen the way that you do what type of peace is that giving you like how how is that are you content how content are you with some of the things you've had because like i said when you when you speak you are very engaged like you're doing right now you're very engaging <laughs> sometimes you freak me out though i'm like i turn red i'm like it's what am, am i saying this wrong but um there there is um there is something about you that's very endearing right and it, is that a confidence in yourself? Is it a belief in the mission? Is it a combination of a whole bunch of things? You know, I think it's a combination of both. One, I know who I am, and I know who I belong to. Okay, that's 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 the that's that, a good everything start. good foundation. From there. Everything starts from there, um, and um, and I believe in the mission and the work of the university. I I have great passion uh, in the work that I do, where it impacts the student experience at the university. Um, I enjoy, and I, th there's, a, there's a personal satisfaction mm -hmm. that I receive when I see a student excel from point A to point C, even just having just a small yeah. impact um, um, on that particular student to get to that point. That's a personal satisfaction for me. So, and what We had mentioned, too, you know, if you're in higher education and you're in it for the money, you probably made the wrong decision and you might want to turn back. Most of the folks that I've talked to in higher education, that is a huge thing for them. Right. They really like to develop right. human beings, develop right. souls, right. Um, and drive people to their, I mean, you literally are like tour guides for their journey. Absolutely, absolutely. I have developed such positive relationships with students. Um, I don't work as close with yeah. them now as I did several years ago, but I still have students that actually work for me back in 1992 who still reach out to me in conversation. We still get together just like the student that I was telling you, former student that I was telling you about in Florida, we still get together um, because the relationship was so engrounded, I guess, is the best yeah. way that I can, I can and impactful. describe. And, and impactful. Absolutely impactful. And impactful for both. Impa that both was interesting. Them Im and me. Impact cast to go both exactly. ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I enjoy mentoring uh, young people. Um, I recognize that I, I am not a mentor for everybody. <laughs> I am not. Well, that's part yeah, of it. I'm not a mentor for everybody. I learned very early uh, with, with mentorship programs um, that I would participate in, and I realized that these programs don't work for me. You just can't assign somebody to me to mentor. No. That's, that doesn't work. But the, the, the ones that happen naturally, uh, those are the mentors. They're authentic. They, those are the authentic ones, exactly. And you, you, look, uh, you don't necessarily choose your mentee as much as they potentially choose the mentor, right? Uh, folks that want to learn a certain thing will find the person that is authentically that. Right. And they'll gravitate to them. Right. And you got to kind of let that happen. You can pair people up and try right. and create right. an opportunity for that. But if, but for it to really work, where it creates that 20 years later, still hanging out, still talking, their desire had to be authentic and your skill set had to be authentic to their desire. Right. 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 And that's when you really got some magic happening. 
when, and, you, and, and, when that happens, right. that's... And it's work on both parts. A lot of people think that that relationship stems from one end to the other, but yeah. it has to be a mutual relationship. It, ha- it has to be. It has to be. It has to be. Um, we are going to throw G's question of the week at you. Now, G has Hi. already a- engaged and asked the question, but we would be remiss to not keep this branded methodology that we have to our show in the club. So here's G's question of the club. Um, I, I got to be honest, John. I actually just jumped in. I, ju- I jumped the gun. Um, that was that was my question for him. It um, wasn't G's question of the club because I didn't say it was G's question of the club yet. <laughs> so that was just a question. It was just a question, David. That was not. Don't count that as G's okay. question of the club. This is now. This is now G's question of the club. There's a new question. I, new I, question. Do, have, I do have another question. Okay. Um, early on, when um, you were, you know, a, a young student, whether it was elementary school or high school. What was it that, you know, attracted you to branding, storytelling, image, imagery, visions? What, what and how did you get there? Was it a, a specific hobby? Was it a specific group that you were a part of? Was it something that you were a fan of? Was it an artist? Was it an athlete? What was that connection for you? Really, really interesting question. See, this is why we do this, G. <laughs> so you're going to ask interesting questions. I would not say that I could specifically pinpoint a moment during that time in my life that connects me to branding, marketing specifically, Storytelling, I think I can pinpoint a moment, not so much elementary, but high school, um, where I was involved with the um, forensics forensics club. Okay. Uh, For real? (laughs) A lot of (laughs) curveballs. Whoa! Whoa. Yeah, I was was district champion in the forensics club. club. Okay, what is happening here? Tell me all about this. (laughs) This was not discussed at lunch. Champion of forensics club. Champion of forensics club. Did you have like the powder you're going around and dusting things? What is happening? No, I, I somehow I became, I was actually the president of the forensics club. And the category. Oh, that had to be tough to have friends because no, no, you could just track no. track down all their, all their mistakes. Who did what? <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 we're in the in the district competition, um, and it was the prepared category. I'm forgetting what the correct terminology is. Uh, it wasn't an impromptu speech. It was a prepared um, speech, and I actually placed first. Uh, in that competition, and and all and all obviously all of the the moments of practicing and rehearsing and getting ready for that moment, um, I think spoke a lot to me around the whole storytelling connection. Now I will say that when we competed on the state level. It was an experience like none other. I went out on the stage, and that's why I say felon is okay. Yeah. <laughs> I went Just out. Went. Yes, I went out on the stage, and I'm pretty much doing the same speech. So that you I, nailed. Know, I got the speech That down. you nailed. Oh, no. I looked out at the audience, which was about... 10 times larger than the district audience. And I literally almost, I lost it. Mm -hmm. I lost it. I think I did eventually deliver the speech, but it was like from a place as if, as if I was not in my body almost. You were like gliding. Yeah. As like, 
Yeah, I almost felt like I wasn't even there. It yes. was it was the strangest thing ever. So Boy, clearly, I, I did not win that competition. <laughs> <laughs> well, competition. well, you weren't there. <laughs> I was not there. I was not there. Um, did you win? I don't know. No, I don't know. I, I, don't I don't know. know. Did I go? <laughs> you learned um, something though. But I have always liked sharing my story, and I think that may have also um, um, had something to do with me going into the ministry and uh, becoming a licensed minister and going into theology. Um, even uh, I can remember my pastor when I was 16 uh, saying to me, uh, boy, you've been called. Hmm. I'm like, what, what, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. God is calling you to preach. Hmm. Or he said, God has called you to preach. And I'm 16. I was very smart. Hung mm -hmm. and still am, but uh, <laughs> like, I don't have a phone. I have a pager. <laughs> no, like, I was, I was like, his name was Reverend Morgan. I said, Reverend Morgan, if he's calling, I'm not answering. Yeah, it, <laughs> not that, answering. it went to voicemail, and it was so amazing that when I decided to um, accept that voice that I was hearing, um, I was maybe in my 30s, and I remember calling him. He was no longer the pastor of my church at that time. He had retired, and I remember calling him to let him know where I was in my, in my stage and that I was going to be um, doing my initial sermon um, at the church. And he was like, I told you. He said, you ran for many years, but I told you, and eventually you have to give in to isn't it amazing how sometimes, not sometimes, so often, people can see things in you yes. oh, absolutely. that you can't see in yourself, absolutely. and then you have the aha moments where you go, holy cow. I, I often think about all the things that my father told me that I just tuned out, and then they hit me, right. <laughs> like especially when I'm talking to my kids or coaching. And I'll just be like, oh, Dad, did you just come through my body, out my mouth? Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll have a moment where I go, man, he said that to me when I was 12 years old. And that just came out right. of my mouth 25, right. 30 years later. Mm -hmm. Holy yep. cow, right? Yeah. It's outstanding. Uh, I want to know when, and I ask this question every single time that we do a podcast. First off, the art of storytelling has been such a consistent um such a consistent thing for almost all of our guests oh. that uh, storytelling is something that they just love to do, that they're struck by it, that they thoroughly enjoy it, that it, there's a science to it. It's an art form um, and how to connect with people. Maybe that's why they're, they're successful in their careers and their life and, and why they're willing to come on a podcast. They like to tell stories, but I'm always curious what people's mindsets are like, um, when I so the way I ask it is when you wake up in the morning your your feet hit the floor. What's the mindset? Hmm. The mindset for me, and I would probably say is the mindset every time I hit the floor is that this is a new day, and can can be done in a new way. Um. It's a new day, and the day can be done mm -hmm. in a new way. That's the innovation. That's the innovation. You like to innovate. Mm -hmm. So that mindset is, hey, let's, let's, let's try and be successful a new way. Hmm. That's interesting. You're making, Perhaps. Me, you're making me see things differently. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> I also do want to compliment you on your look. Um, the, the, uh, we obviously have the same stylist. Oh. Um, we both are bald and beautiful with outstanding beards and you guys can all be jealous. It's fine. How David, long have you, you been bald? Well, uh, this is a, this, this is not, I'm actually on the swim team, which is, I'm just kidding. No, I, I started shaving my head when I was about 32. So same here. 13 years. Yeah. Okay. Same here. I started to get that hairline where there was just not enough ways that I could move it around. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then we just went with it. And I was doing the clippers, and then I said, you know what? Let's go straight razor and see what happens. And you just don't go back. Right. There is right. no there's no other right. way. But I don't want to make you guys jealous. So 
I'll stop talking about that. Well, I was going to compliment his shoes. Yes, I've been checking those out periodically throughout the day. <laughs> got a nice feet. And the hat. <laughs> Come on, we got to get you. So there's been many compliments on the hat, the whole style, and Adorable. doing it with Mason on. Uh, <laughs> what did you think of the tour? Oh, the tour was awesome. Um, I always like um, touring different facilities uh, that our licensees have. Um, and what I got exposed to here. Um, that I have not yet been exposed to is the actual embroidery uh, process. So that was pretty amazing um, mm-hmm. to see that. And one of the ideas that I think I might steal <laughs> from you guys. I mean, we gave you a tour, so it's not stealing. Not we kind of showed it to you. That whole gong thing that you guys have. Yeah. That too amazing. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. My heart just melted. I am going to figure out how to um, bring that to. <laughs> or perhaps or perhaps Club Colors is going to figure out how to brand a gong for you and go. might have that in the mail to you oh, soon. So right. if you enjoy that gong that oh, much, I, did. I believe uh, Lindsay starts sourcing <laughs> and go. <laughs> That's really interesting because I'm I obviously correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the wishboard is. Um, what is taken most, right? People are like, oh, I want to incorporate a wishboard. You know, that's awesome. It's a rally point. But I don't know how often we get people who are like, no, that gong is really? going to be a thing for me now. It's, yeah. your, it's, it's your, your, your thought around it. It is about celebration. Remember now, a, a lot of, and at least in my culture, a lot of things are celebrated around music and uh-huh. sound. And, and so that's what I associate yeah. that with. And when you were sharing that when um, your staff – they reach certain goals of success. They get to celebrate it by hitting that gong. That is just amazing to me. Wow, that I'm, is. I'm, I'm touched you say that. And, you know, it was interesting because some of the folks that were here that were more veteran were like, I'm, I'm not hitting that thing. I just <laughs> want to tell you right now. Like, I'm not, I'm not doing it. And um, it was interesting to pull them aside and kind of say, hey, look, you're not doing it for you. The, the recognition is not always for the person being recognized. It's to inspire those that have yeah, not no. been recognized Absolutely. to want to feel that way. And that was the whole meaning behind it. Once they got that, they became champions for it. And they understood that this is not, this is not a spiking of the ball, right, in the face of the defense or in the face of your client. This is telling your peers, you can do this too, right? I'm here with you. And so it's a, it's a lot of – kind of telling the story, we'll go back to storytelling, telling the story of success. I don't know about you, David, but I believe that success breeds success. Wins create wins, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it becomes a, a momentum. And hopefully uh, Coach English will stack a whole bunch of wins for you. Absolutely. David, you have been a fantastic <laughs> guest. We are absolutely thrilled that you came to join us in Thank the club. You. Thank you for having it's me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I wish we could keep going. Um, but I would, I have a feeling that, um, we would be here till 11 o'clock tonight (laughs) and just keep talking and talking. So maybe we'll just turn (laughs) off the microphones or turn off the recording and just keep the microphones on and keep talking. But one thing I do know, David, yes, we are, we are going to have (laughs) some geo Mason. Uh, those of you listening to this, you need to go online and find some geo Mason because it's not only a fantastic wine, but you're supporting a fantastic cause. There are folks out there that cannot afford to have a higher education. And if you could buy some wine to help them, go get a fantastic education at George Mason University. Go join the likes of David Atkins and his brilliance and the atmosphere and the environment that has been created there. And uh, do it with some spirits. Why not? Look at the branding brilliance. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been in the club. Hit it, G. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of In the Club. Remember, Club Colors is a brand management firm out of Schaumburg, Illinois, but we have an international reach. We specialize in purpose over product, but you got to have great product in order to get your purpose out. I mean, come on. Guess what? Club Colors can source it, decorate it, kit it, and ship it. Our why is making you the hero. David, you're our hero. Thank you so much. That's been in the club.
I know that's what you wanted to do. 